theory is that she was able to completely block the bacteria because she had two copies of the protective mutation, one from each parent. So would people with one copy have only limited resistance? Margaret Blackwell actually contracted plague and then recovered. If she had only one copy of Delta 32, did that mean she had enough resistance to keep her alive, but not enough to ward off the bacteria completely? It may be that individuals with one copy of Delta 32 actually postpone the onset of death. And in that meantime, the armament of the immune system, which has many different uh, battalions, if you will, could be mounting an immune response sufficient to clear out the, uh, uh, the bacterium so that the individual actually survives rather than dies. Those villagers with two copies of Delta 32 may never have gotten ill. While those with one copy may have developed symptoms, but then stood a good chance of survival. Those without any copies contracted the disease with no hope of recovery. The evidence indicates that one tiny genetic mistake has given generations of families resistance to the plague. But the story of Delta 32 does not end there. For it turns out that the European survivors passed on a life-saving legacy even more far-reaching than resistance to the plague. A legacy that 700 years later is proving crucial in our fight against another deadly disease, the modern-day curse of AIDS. Over the last two decades, there have been 18 million deaths from AIDS worldwide. The culprit, the HIV virus, has become the most prolific killer in the world since the Black Death. But their killing power is not the only congruence between the two diseases. Although HIV is a virus and plague is a bacterium, research has shown that they attack the body in very similar ways. This is the link that first sparked O'Brien's interest in the plague. A comparison of the two diseases illustrates that the HIV virus and the plague bacterium trick the immune system in precisely the same way. They both target and take over the white blood cells that get sent to destroy them. Steve's story begins in California in the early 80s a time when more gay people than ever were taking to the streets to celebrate their lifestyle. People no longer felt the need to hide their sexuality. There were more gay people. There were, uh, there were more people, because it was the baby boom generation. And we had more of an opportunity to express ourselves. Part of that was very much a sexual expression. So in that sense, it was hedonistic. We had the music, we had disco, we had drugs, and we could dance all night and, and all day. But as they continued their hedonistic behavior, doctors were beginning to see symptoms of a then unknown disease spreading through their ranks. It started with dark purple blotches on the skin. Swollen lymph nodes followed. Something sinister had arrived. Steve Crone was oblivious to the looming menace. For him and his circle of friends, the leisurely California afternoons remained carefree and relaxed. Then his lover Jerry got sick. At the time, no one knew what it was. And it was an emotional nightmare because he was sick for 15 months and there was never a diagnosis. So you had somebody who was, um, who went blind, who w lost 30 pounds in weight, who had a uh, cytomegalovirus in their liver, who had all kinds of uh, horrific kinds of tests. It was like, it was like the exorcist, if you remember the exorcist, and that kid is submitted to all these different scans and, all, and blood draws and dies. Being, and it was exactly the same as that. Suddenly, this person went from being 34 years old and totally vital and a gymnast and 
handsome and healthy and and then was suddenly like living with an 85 year old man you just keep maintaining this positive picture of them as a healthy person until you finally turn a corner and to be honest I actually was an astrologist who told me he was going to die I was never a doctor Jerry died on March 4th 1982 he was the fifth person in America to die of what would later become known as AIDS But even as individuals began to fall ill, the partying continued. People were unaware that they were now playing Russian roulette every time they had unprotected sex. For the ill-equipped doctors, the growing epidemic was more than they could handle. It was a siege. A day wouldn't go by in which there, there wouldn't be a, some unexpected complication. Uh, there was no time to think. It was all a matter of reacting. Much, I guess, like one would react during, during a war, during an attack. You can't really process that many people dying all the time. So if you're going to a funeral, you know, if somebody's dying every month or every, every year, there maybe I would have lost, over the course of that decade, I lost about 70 to 80 people. So you're talking about a lot of funerals and a lot of memorials. And there was really nobody left. In 1984, Steve moved to New York City. Stunned by the loss of so many close friends, he assumed it would only be a matter of time before he met the same fate. His actions had been no different from theirs. Why should he survive when they all perished? The only other experience you could find where all of your friends are dying around you of the same age would be if you were in the war and your platoon is wiped out. The thought was that I would eventually get AIDS and die. But strangely, despite his high-risk behavior, Steve Crone did not get AIDS. Test after test showed the same result, negative for HIV. There was nothing different about his experience. That was what was so striking. That he was in the same place as everyone else in his environment, in his risk group, did the same things as everyone else in his risk group. The only difference was that he wasn't infected. And it wasn't that he was a superman. What was unusual was simply that he could not be, he was not infected with HIV. I was mentioning this question of how was I to a family relative at some party? And they said, well, why don't they test you then? They study other children when you find that everybody in the family has a disease and this one child doesn't get the disease. Why don't they study that child. Why aren't they doing that with you? And I thought, see, that sounds, makes sense. Why aren't they studying me? So it just sort of inspired me to make another round of phone calls to doctors and see if there were any trials out there. And there weren't. I really did a lot of phone work. There weren't any trials, because there are numbers you can call HIV trial. There was nobody studying HIV negative men. And so until I found uh, Bill Paxton. Paxton was a young doctor who quickly saw the potential benefits of examining cases like Steve's. He persuaded his lab chief at the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center in New York City to let him try a new experiment. His idea was to analyze the blood of high-risk but HIV-negative test subjects. He hoped that the blood would provide clues to how the virus worked. Steve was a perfect candidate. The center had no study of people who were exposed to HIV but who had remained negative. Being in New York, you knew those people were there. I mean, you met those people. Steve was one of them. Paxton took a sample of his blood and bombarded it with the HIV virus. 3,000 times the normal amount needed to infect a cell. But in spite of the massive doses of the virus, Steve's cells did not become infected. 
red colors in the well indicate the amount of viral activity and as you see as you go across here these individuals have a viral production and then you come to Steve's cells his white blood cells and you see there's no red those wells stay white suggesting there's no viral replication Paxton repeated the tests to be sure we thought maybe we'd infected the culture with bacteria or whatever so we went back to Steve but again it was the same result we went back again, again, same result. Once they were positive that nothing was contaminating the samples, the team began the next step in the investigation, trying to figure out what was protecting Steve's cells from the virus. Looking at the DNA, Paxton saw something striking. No matter how much HIV was mixed with Steve's blood, the virus did not enter his cells he seemed to have a blocking mechanism that prevented them from attaching. Further tests confirmed that this resistance was provided by the Delta 32 mutation. At long last, Steve had the explanation he was looking for. It was not just dumb luck that had kept him safe from HIV for all this time. His protection came from a mutant gene that had been passed down by his European ancestors. I took it in a very uh, cautious manner, but it was also very exciting to be able to tell my family I may never be able to catch AIDS. That was, the, that was like the first reaction, I think, for myself. Really to tell my nieces and nephews and my sisters that they would not have to go through what I saw so many other families go through. I think that was the greatest bonus. For O'Brien, the investigation had come full circle. An analysis of his own database of Delta 32 samples revealed that just like with resistance to the plague, people with one copy of the mutation showed a delay in developing AIDS if they were infected with HIV. The data also showed that those people like Steve, who had two copies of the Delta 32 mutation, almost three million people in the United States and Britain had virtually total resistance to the disease. They could not get AIDS. And the explanation was really quite simple. These people did not have the entry portal for HIV to get in, and therefore, even if they were exposed over and over, they did not become infected. And this was the first genetic restriction that had been discovered against an infectious disease in humans, and it was a, it was a whopper. The investigation was now complete, and the results were staggering. A tiny genetic mistake had saved a lucky few from a painful and gruesome death in plague-stricken medieval Europe. And now, hundreds of years later, their descendants are being protected from another epidemic by the same inherited mutation. The plague cut a huge swathe of death across the old world wreaking havoc on the populations of town after town. But as happens in evolution, genetic mutations provided a selective advantage, and those who survived passed on to their offspring a priceless resistance to HIV. The mystery of the Black Death has at last been solved, and with our new understanding of Delta 32 has come a whole new field of AIDS research based on genetic resistance. By looking back at the past, we have been able to take great steps forward in our fight against today's most deadly disease. Ah.